This morning's text brings us to the conclusion of our series in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. And for me, that is a sadness. I've wanted to build tents here and remain for some time. This is the end of the chapter. We've been able to focus here on Jesus as the good shepherd. To see what it means to put our lives under his care and to find still waters and green pastures. Those who are shepherded by Jesus are found to be safe in his care. Eternally secure under his shepherding. There is a stabilizing benefit to gazing at Christ, to meditating on him, to thinking about him. In an unstable world, the Lord Jesus Christ is an anchor for the soul. And contemplating chapters like this are a balm and a help for us. I'm going to read to you the final verses of this chapter And then we'll unfold its meaning. Beginning in verse 37, we read this from the pen of John, by the Holy Spirit, God's word. If I do not do the works of my father, Jesus said, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. The end of this chapter seemed to me to be a little bit anticlimactic, sort of a denouement on this amazing pinnacle section of scripture. It, of course, sets the stage for John chapter 11. Jesus goes to Bethany beyond the Jordan, which is a four days walk away from where Lazarus, his friend, would be sick and would die. Jesus' intentional departure served several purposes. It was the end of his public ministry, and he would be away when his friend Lazarus was sick. In fact, he intentionally remained away when Lazarus was said to be sick and did not leave until Lazarus had died, which meant four days later, after it was very clear that Lazarus was dead, Jesus would arrive and raise him. There are other reasons Jesus has left here, departed. The end of his public ministry is in this scene. He will no longer be found teaching in the temple precincts. He has left the area of Jerusalem until he comes back to be crucified. So the ending of John chapter 10 sort of is the off-ramp for this climactic scene we've been looking at, and it sets the stage for what follows. But in John chapter 10, we have had this bombastic conversation followed by attempted murder, and the end of it is simply Jesus goes away. What we're going to look at in this chapter are three witnesses that verify Jesus' claims. What Jesus has been saying in John chapter 10 are truly monumental things. They are watershed statements that divide humanity. There's no neutrality when it comes to Christ. And the things that he has claimed for himself in John chapter 10 divide necessarily every human being between what Jesus said is either true or it's not. There's no middle ground of affinity for Jesus while maybe he said some good things, but these, maybe not all these claims are accurate. This is a crucial text, and, and the chapter concludes with three witnesses to the truth of Jesus' claims. And as we come to those three witnesses, I want to review the claims that Jesus makes for himself in John chapter 10. Let's review just a little bit. These are exclusive 
and offensive claims that Jesus makes in his showdown with the religious leaders in Jerusalem. The Pharisees and the other religious leaders who oversee God's people, who claim to speak for God, who claim to be gatekeepers to heaven, they themselves do not know God and they've oppressed God's people. And Jesus has made claims before them. He said, first of all, that the leadership of Israel were bad shepherds. In fact, they were no shepherds at all. They were thieves and robbers, verse 1. But Jesus, by contrast, is the shepherd of the sheep, verse 2. Jesus possessed the right to enter the sheepfold and to retrieve his sheep, verse 3. Jesus exclusively knows and calls his sheep individually and leads them out, verse 3. He leads them out of apostate Israel. He leads them out from under bad religion, out from under hypocritical leadership. In verse 4, Jesus makes the claim that he is the true shepherd, and that's evidenced by the fact that the true sheep follow him and recognize his voice. Further, he claims that true sheep do not follow those bad leaders, verse 5. Then Jesus says he is the door. That is the way of salvation, verses 7 and 9. He goes on to say that every other claim to being the door is a thief and a robber, verse 8. Jesus claims in verse 10 to provide life, to give life and to provide it abundantly. In verse 10, he says that the false religious leaders have come to steal and to kill and destroy. In verse 11, Jesus claimed that he would lay down his life for the sheep. He says that hirelings flee at the first sign of danger because they care more about themselves than about sheep. Verses 12 to 13. In verse 13, Jesus claims to be the good shepherd. An exclusive, powerful, beautiful, offensive claim. Verse 14, Jesus claims to personally know his sheep and to be personally known by his sheep. Then he says that he personally, intimately knows the Father and is known by the Father. Verse 15. In verse 16, Jesus claims that he will not only get his own sheep out of apostate Israel, he will also go and get his sheep from the Gentile nations. In verse 17, Jesus claimed to be specially loved by the Father. In verses 17 and 18, Jesus claimed to have authority over life and death, including over his own life and death. Jesus claimed to carry out the express command of God in verse 25, that his works are the works of God. They are done in the name of God, by the power of God, and with the authority of God. Jesus claims in verse 27 to powerfully guarantee the faith, the obedience, and the security of his sheep. In verse 28, Jesus claimed to give eternal life. And in verse 30, Jesus made this claim, I and the Father are one. Jesus claimed in John chapter 10 to be God. We see this from the I am statements in verse 7, 11, and 14. He is playing on the very name of God, that personal name of God, Yahweh, which is derived from the basic verb to be. And Jesus saying, I am, he is very clearly making an audacious, in fact, a blasphemous statement if he is a mere man, but an absolutely true declaration if he is indeed God in the flesh. Jesus is claiming to be God by claiming to be a fulfillment of Ezekiel 34, that Old Testament promise that God himself would come and shepherd his people and deal with the bad shepherds of Israel. Jesus claims to be God by his close affiliation with the Father. And Jesus claims to be God with his authority over life and death in verses 17 and 18. And finally, Jesus claims to be God by his fulfillment of Psalm 82. You will remember that Jesus appealed to Psalm 82, where God himself said he would come and stand in the midst of unjust rulers as God and judge them for their corruption. Jesus does that very thing as he is encircled by the unjust judges who are trying to murder him. And while they are committed to deicide, 
It is very clear who is in charge of the scene. Jesus has assembled this scene because he is God in the flesh, fulfilling Old Testament promises that he himself would visit his people. Jesus' audacious declaration is that he is God in the flesh. And so John chapter 10 is, is not a dismissible conversation. It's not the empty blather of an idle babbler. You simply cannot ignore the claims of Jesus. If these claims are false, then Jesus of Nazareth was a mere man and a very bad man, a blasphemer, a liar, a fraud. He's a nothing. And to attribute to such a man any value whatsoever is itself awful. Such a man is not worthy of a following. He's not worthy of respect. He's not worthy of a place in history. Much less is he to be worshipped, followed, and loved. But if these claims are true, then Jesus is the only hope of fallen mankind. Everyone must surrender himself and follow him in order to be saved from the wrath of God, which is to come. If these claims are true, then every religion under the sun is a false way, a system of imposters led by thieves and robbers and murderers and destroyers. And if these claims are true, then Jesus Christ is over all and he is God blessed forever. Romans 9, 5. He is our great God and Savior, Titus 2.13. He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature, Hebrews 1.3. He is God whom the angels worship, Hebrews 1.6-8. He is the builder of all things, Hebrews 3.3-4. 3, 3 he is the one to whom glory is due forever and ever, Hebrews 13.21. He is the one to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. 1 Peter 4.11, he is the true God and eternal life, 1 John 5.20. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, Revelation chapter 1, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation chapter 5, and he will come to avenge the justice of God and to reign on the earth, Revelation 19. His robe will be dipped in blood and he will tread the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. He is King of kings and he is Lord of lords and before him every knee will bow. In his presence, every tongue will confess these truths. These are monumental claims. And you cannot be indifferent about Jesus. There is no neutral ground here. He is either the God to whom you will give account of your life, worthy of all glory, or he is a nothing, a contemptible fraud, worthy of stoning. To be neutral about Jesus, the... Yeah, me and Jesus, we're okay with each other, but I don't want to surrender my life to him. He was probably a good teacher, maybe a moral guy. That attitude is like building a home between the trenches in World War I. There are mines on the ground, artillery in the air, barbed wire all around, and you will not survive. You may think you can temporarily sit in some neutral territory with Jesus, but it will not last. You will meet him face to face one day very soon. So who do you say that he is? Who does your life say that Jesus is? You see, your lips can have an empty profession. You can assent intellectually to truths about Jesus, but what does your life proclaim? If it is not surrendered in total to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are in bad territory. The religious leaders in John 10 chose wrong. They have taken up stones to stone him. And in verses 37 to 42, to close out John 10, John records the conclusion of this showdown with the religious leadership. And this scene gives us three witnesses that verify Jesus' claims. The first witness to the truth of Jesus' claims are the miracles of Jesus. This is found in verses 37 and 38. Look down at your Bibles. Jesus said, if I do not do the works of my father... Do not believe me. 
But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. Jesus sets up an if then statement. If the first thing is true, then the second thing follows. And the first thing is stated as if true for the sake of argument. But if the first statement is not true, then the second one doesn't follow. And so Jesus puts it to them. If I do not do the works of my father. What's striking about this is Jesus is giving credit to the triune God and specifically to his father for the things he has been doing, the business he has been about, the miracles he has accomplished, the compassionate deeds he has done, the authoritative truth he has preached. He is not out on his own. He is not out on a limb. He is doing exactly his father's business in all of his earthly ministry. He and the father are one. And when you've seen Jesus operate, you've seen God. He is the exact representation of his being. And so the father's works are on display in the work of Jesus Christ. And if that's not so, then don't believe his words. But the works themselves testify that the gracious, kind, compassionate, cutting, convicting, glorious, life-giving words of Jesus are the truth. Most immediately, the work on display here is the healing of the man born blind from birth in John 9. And, and you remember the scene. It is the backdrop of John 10. And a man who had been born blind all of a sudden could see because Jesus supernaturally made him see. This is creative power. This is a power that no one has ever seen or attested before. It is unmistakably from above. And it was undeniable. The Pharisees were eyewitnesses to the event. They couldn't deny the miracle. They certainly couldn't deny its compassion. And they hated it. They hated it with a murderous envy that sought to protect their own turf to which Jesus was a threat. They lacked compassion for the man they should have been caring for who was disabled. So much so that they kicked him out of their communion simply because Jesus graciously dealt with him. All of that is the backdrop of this chapter. That is the work most immediately brought to mind in this statement. But you can think of the other things that the gospel of John records. The water turned to wine at the wedding of Cana in chapter two, the healing of the royal official son in chapter four, the man who was lame for 38 years healed at the pool of Bethesda in chapter five, the thousands who were fed on the shore of Galilee in chapter six. And in the following chapter, Jesus will raise Lazarus from the dead. All of these things in the gospel of John are the works of the father, which testify to the truth of Jesus claims. They make it unmistakably clear that he can say these things because he is God in the flesh. And aside from the miraculous works, there are the authoritative works. He cleansed the temple in chapter two of the gospel of John. He authoritatively taught truth differently than all the other teachers who came before him in throughout his earthly ministry. And his entire earthly ministry was marked by compassion and kindness and humility and love displayed to hurting people. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the other works of Jesus not contained in the gospel of John. And the gospel of John concludes with this statement, John 20 verse 30, Jesus did many more works than are recorded than these. And surely the books of the world could not contain all of it. But these ones are recorded so that you may believe and that by believing you may have eternal life. The works testify to the truth of Jesus identity and his claims. What was the purpose of the miracles and the good works that Jesus did? Certainly they flowed out of a compassionate heart for hurting people. But Jesus has not seen fit to end all suffering yet. To cease all hurt yet. To wipe away every tear yet. He will do that for his people. But the point of Jesus' miracles was not to bring about a a new miraculous age where nobody hurts. Yet, 
But everywhere he went in his earthly ministry, it's like the divine light of heaven shining down in kingdom realities. Wherever the king went on the earth and disease ran away, demons fled, blindness left, lameness leapt. And you get these precursors and these hints of an age to come everywhere Jesus went. But these signs, these miracles were pointers Pointers to the future reality of Jesus' coming kingdom when he reigns on the earth. Pointers to his identity. This is why they are called signs. They are signs pointing to a reality. Pointing to Jesus' messianic credentials. Pointing to his identity as God in the flesh. And they are supernatural signs. They they, they bring about the creative power that only God can do. They are demonstrations of the Father's endorsement and commission and participation in Jesus' works. And notice Jesus' words, if the Father is not working through me, if I'm not doing the kinds of things that Messiah must do, if you're not witnessing divine power and divine compassion, in other words, if you're not seeing the ability to create physical material out of nothing, fish, from nothing, bread from nothing, wine from nothing, power over deformed and injured bodies, eyes, hands, and limbs, power over demons and demonic oppression, power over death itself, all mixed with compassion for the broken, the needy, the hungry, the thirsty, and the oppressed. If you're not seeing these things, the Father's works, fresh creative power, then you may disregard my claims. That is Jesus' challenge here. He says, in fact, you must disregard my words if you're not seeing the Father's works through me. But if I do them, he says, verse 38, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. The works testify to the veracity of Jesus' claims. And of course, Jesus did do these things. And so the imperative stands, you must believe. You must believe the testimony of these works. They are the Father's. They are the Father's through the Son. And Jesus says, believe them so that you may know and understand. In the original, it is the same word used twice in two different forms. So therefore, in English, you you get two different words, know and understand. The first is an initial acquisition of knowledge. And the second is an ongoing growth and understanding. And what are you to acquire and then continue in your understanding of what truth? Jesus says, the father is in me and I am in the father. This mutually in one another state that the son and the father share. This is a Trinitarian relationship on display. It'll be developed further in the gospel of John in chapter 14 and chapter 17. But to reject the claims of Jesus is to deny the testimony of the works of Jesus, which are the testimony of the father. It is a denial of the very work of God. The Pharisees here who claim to be the gatekeepers for God. To get to God, people, you got to go through us. They are in the process of denying the very work of God through the Son of God before their very eyes. Listen, you cannot be on a good standing with God having rejected the claims and the demands of Jesus the Christ. He is the only way to God. He is the only way to be right with God. He is the way and the truth and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through Him. And the miracles of Jesus proved that he spoke the truth. Now, you and I sitting here today are not eyewitnesses to those works. We read them secondhand. We we read about them in the Gospel of John. We read them in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But the religious leaders in this text were. They were eyewitnesses. They saw them and they could not deny them. In fact, in the next chapter, in such stark depiction of the hard-heartedness that will not believe when the truth is seen firsthand, is amazing. John 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. The religious leaders saw Lazarus alive after he was in the grave. And what what was their hard-hearted response? Bury him again. (laughs) 
We've got to kill him. Because if word gets out, everybody will believe Jesus. What should they have said? Oh, Jesus is stronger than death. I want to be on his side. How hard is the human heart? When it wants to protect those things, it wants to protect. Jesus, you can't get in here. I like this stuff. I like my life the way it is. I like my position. In their case, I like my power and authority, and I like oppressing people. See, Jesus' truth claims, claims about his own identity, and therefore his demand on his creatures are a threat when we don't want to surrender. So you circle the wagons and build a fortress against Jesus. That's what they did. And they saw it firsthand. The works are a testimony to the truth claims of Christ. They're not the only witness in this passage. The second witness of the truth claims of Christ is the response of the leadership. Look down at verse 39. Therefore, do you see that? Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp. What is the response to the obvious testimony of supernatural divine power at work through the Son of God on the earth in their presence? Murder. That's the response. That is the hard-hearted response of the religious leadership who got to see Jesus firsthand as eyewitnesses. They didn't hear stories. They didn't hear somebody else say, hey, there was this guy downtown who did this thing and I saw it, I promise. No, they saw it themselves. And they sought to kill him. The leader's rejection of Jesus serves as a testimony of the truth claims of Jesus. What do I mean by that? Listen to John 1.5. The light shined in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. They are the darkness. They're doing exactly what John 1, 5 said they would do. John 1, 11, he came to his own and his own did not receive him. They are right here, not receiving him. And the Old Testament scriptures predicted that he would be betrayed, crucified, and that he would rise from the dead. Genesis 3.15 says that Jesus, or the seed of the woman, would receive a crushing blow from the serpent, even as he would deliver a mortal, eternally fatal crushing blow to the serpent's head. Isaiah 53 says that he would be despised, forsaken of men, and rejected. And both Zechariah 12.10 and Isaiah 53.5 says that Jesus would be pierced, for our transgressions. Daniel 2 describes that stone carved out, not by human hands, but that stone that would come down out of heaven and crush all human kingdoms at the end of time. But that stone would be rejected at his first coming. He is instead a rock of offense. Isaiah 6 describes the prophet's commission after seeing the pre-incarnate Christ in a heavenly vision, holy and lifted up, highly exalted, and the, the living creatures worshiping the pre-incarnate Christ, after Isaiah saw him, Isaiah is given the commission to go tell Israel about the holy, holy, holy God. And God says, Isaiah, and they're not going to listen. You're going to hear, you're going to speak and they won't hear. They're going to witness and they will not see. They want hard heartedness and God says, I will give them hard heartedness. These things aren't a surprise. The reaction of the religious leaders is actually required for Jesus to go to the cross. The rejection by the religious leaders is predicted in the Old Testament. Why did they respond this way? Precisely because Jesus is God in the flesh. Precisely because he did do the works of God. Precisely because the presence of God was an indictment to the hypocrites who did not want God. Their hard-heartedness reveals the truths of Jesus' statements. And why did they respond in this way? John tells us in chapter 10, verse 25... Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. 
The works that I do in my father's name, they testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Jesus came for his sheep. These hypocritical religious leaders are not his sheep. And so they do not believe. Their response is a fulfillment of the scriptures and evidence that Jesus is who he says he is. There's a third witness to the truth of Jesus claims in this passage. And it closes out the chapter beginning in verse 40. Jesus went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing and he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. And you just get this kind of throwaway statement. He went away. He eluded their grasp. Verse 39. And you have to remember the scene. They, they have circled him and Solomon's portico with rocks in their pockets. Uh, They've got Jesus trapped, physically speaking. How does he get out? The text doesn't tell us. It's not the first time Jesus has eluded their grasp. After his first public teaching event uh, near his hometown in the synagogue, they tried to throw him off a cliff and he just got away somehow. And over and again in the Gospels, Jesus eludes their grasp and gets away. They made attempts to seize him. And they can't, and the text merely tells us because his time had not yet come. Is this miraculous? Perhaps. Is it providential distraction while Jesus walks through them? Perhaps. The text merely tells us he eluded them and he went away. Where did he go? This leads us to that third witness. It is the testimony of John the Baptist. The testimony of John the Baptist. And in John chapter 10, verse 40, John the Baptist is already dead. He has already decreased. His prayer was answered that Jesus must increase and he must decrease. He's off the scene. He, he, he's gone. And, and here he's mentioned for the last time in the Gospel of John to, to bring us back to some memory of the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Verse 40 tells us Jesus went away. Uh, where did he go? He, he went away beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. And he remained there. This is the point where Jesus' public ministry in Jerusalem is done. He he has left Jerusalem. In fact, when he goes back near Jerusalem to the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, it's still on the outskirts, and he will not come back into Jerusalem until the Passion Week when he comes back and is betrayed and crucified. He has left the temple precincts, and we would cry out, Ichabod, the glory of God has gone The glory of Yahweh has come down and and been amongst his people and stood in the midst of the unjust rulers. He's been at the very temple where the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament were that were prefiguring him and pointing to his substitutionary sacrificial death on the cross. Right where they happened, where the blood poured out of the building day after day after day as innocent animals were slain in the place of sinners again and again and again. And all of that would come to an end and completion in Jesus' perfect final sacrifice for sin. And he was here. And he left. And he goes beyond. He he goes outside of Jerusalem. In fact, outside of the territory of Judea, across the river to the other side of the Jordan River, about 90 miles to the northeast to Batanea, about a four days walk away. And he is no longer publicly teaching and doing good works in Jerusalem. This is dramatic. This goes back to the desert, back to the opening scenes of his public ministry, back where John the Baptist was originally baptizing. And and what would happen? The glory of Yahweh has left the temple precincts. What now? 
Is he Messiah? Will he sit on David's throne? Will he usher in the kingdom? Will he overthrow the Romans? Will this be the end of the times of the Gentiles? Would he bring God's shalom to the land and all the blessings promised? Would he be recognized and embraced as Messiah? Oh, for a moment when he reenters Jerusalem and rides on the foal of a donkey in fulfillment of scripture and they cry out, Hosanna, God save us. Blessed be the one who comes in the name of Yahweh. And the fickle crowd will not maintain their worship. A week later, they would cry out, crucify him, crucify him. No, he will be rejected and despised. Unrecognized for who he is and betrayed. Verse 40 tells us he, he remained there. Jesus stayed there some three or four months before he would come back to Jerusalem to be killed. In verse 41, we find out a little more about John. Many came to Jesus and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. And there's this statement given, John did no signs. And it leaves you grammatically with this anticipation, but, but what? John did no sign. Well, well, what did he do? If if he didn't do miracles, what good is his ministry? I mean, the guy was kind of weird. Lived out in the desert by himself, dressed in camel's hair. He ate honey and bugs. And then he preached a hard message, repentance. He, He told people who were very religious that they didn't have what it takes. That they were actually unclean. Unworthy to know God. And they needed something else. They needed to be washed. They needed to be cleansed. And and John himself would wash with water. Something of a symbol. But one who is coming after. With fire and the Holy Spirit. And, And that one. I'm not worthy to untie his shoes. He comes after me. He was before me. That one is the Lamb of God. Who takes away the sin of the world. Follow him. That was John's message. He was the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. He was a messenger. What did John have? Famines, lightning from the sky like Elijah, raising the dead, healing the lame, causing the blind. None of those things. John performed no sign. John himself was a sign. But he didn't have supernatural powers. John was something like the last Old Testament prophet pointing to Messiah. And John got to see him. John got to introduce him to the world. But John's was a ministry of words, of proclamation, of witness by speaking. He did no sign, he preached. He proclaimed, he pointed. John's ministry was perhaps unimpressive, but we find out here in John 10 that his ministry was lasting. It endured. His was a lasting testimony. In fact, John the Baptist's greatness was his humility and his faithful witness. He didn't see the fruits of his labor. He did not witness the results of his preaching. And this gets at something that has to do with what it means to be faithful. Trust over time when the circumstances don't change. When I'm loyal to Christ, but a harvest is not on the horizon. When faithful labor might seem like fruitless endeavor. John the Baptist trusted and proclaimed. John's ministry was the spoken word about Christ. And his ministry bore posthumous testimony. He spoke after he died. Look at verse 42. Many believed in Jesus there. Where? At the home of John's ministry, at the home of John's preaching, in the echo of John's sermons. 
with the shadow of John's finger pointing, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus comes back to that spot. And many were coming to Jesus there, and many believed in him. This last mention of John the Baptist in the Gospel of John follows the previous last mention, which was in chapter 5, verse 36. And even then, that was in the rearview mirror. John is long gone, long off the scene by this point in the Gospel. The message outlived the messenger. Herod could imprison John. Herod could decapitate John. But Herod could not stop the gospel. He could not stop the good news that John preached. That the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That the Messiah has come. That the Lamb of God is here. Think about our witness today. Our testimony of Christ and his work, it's, it's something akin to John the Baptist. He looked forward, we look back. But our witness is not like Jesus. We do not perform miraculous signs to validate our words, to, to vindicate our nature, or to self-identify as Messiah. Jesus alone did that. And our witness is not like the apostolic age. That first generation of the church before the word of God was penned and circulated when the apostles who by office were required to have been eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ and by office were required to actually perform miraculous signs that were like Jesus miracles so that everybody would know, hey, they're just saying stuff. Yeah, but they do the things that Jesus did by miraculous signs, pointers to the veracity of their words. We now have their words in the New Testament. So we don't do miracles like the apostles. Those have died and gone off the scene. We don't have supernatural powers. I can't speak to what you wear or what you eat. We might not be as strange as John the Baptist. But our ministries, our testimonies are fairly unimpressive by the world's standards. We preach a crucified Messiah. For some, perhaps boring. For others, perhaps scandalous or blasphemous. But it is not what the world wants to hear. And maybe you've wished at times that you could call down lightning from heaven and prove to everybody that Jesus is true. Maybe you've hoped for some magical apologetic proof. If I just use the perfectly crafted, reasoned argument, the intellectual elites of the world will cower and they'll believe. Listen, don't get the wrong idea about powers and signs. The enemies of Moses did signs by demons. Satan is an angel of light. He's got supernatural power. During the tribulation, there will be demons and an antichrist and another beast who are able to perform miraculous signs on the earth. And unbelief was not conquered by Jesus himself rising from the dead or raising others from the dead or making a blind man see or causing a lame man to jump up and down. Do you know where the power is? Witnesses. The truth of Christ proclaimed. In the hands of the Holy Spirit of God, who takes God's word and a proclamation about Christ from a humble, faithful servant and creates life where there was only death. That's power. Our witness is something like John's. John the Baptist's ministry was preparatory. Ours looks back. Friends, how is your witness? How is your witness? In your world, where you live. Who did you talk to this week about Christ? Who will you talk to this next week about Christ? Who in your home needs to hear about Jesus, the Messiah. Who in your workplace needs to know the Savior. 
Who on the sprawling campus of Arizona State University needs to hear about Jesus? Who in the apartment buildings around us needs to know Christ? Who in Guadalupe needs to hear about Jesus in Spanish? Who in your extended family? Who in your workplace? Who in your classroom at school or on your sports team? Who in your neighborhood needs to hear from you about Christ? And if not from you, then from whom? That's why we're still on the earth. Who in Italy and who in Papua New Guinea need to hear about Christ? That's why we send our friends far away. We give testimony from the word of God. The power is in the word of God and the hands of the spirit of God to create the people of God by gospel proclamation. And friends, there's another testimony. There's another witness to the power of God and it is supernatural. It is miraculous. And friends, it is your own life. If you are in Christ here today, You have had your sins forgiven. You have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's own beloved son. And you did not deserve it. You weren't looking for it. You couldn't have found it by your own means. You did not have the resources to get to God. You did not have the wherewithal to look for him. And God saved you. And when you were dead in your transgressions and sins, Ephesians 2, 5, God made you alive. You went from corpse to Christ's. You belong to him. You are adopted. You are declared righteous. And you are left here on this earth in a yet imperfect state to be a witness and a trophy of grace and a testimony of supernatural power. You have a story to tell. Don't be surprised at hard hearts. You have been raised from death to life already, Christian. You tell somebody and they say, ah, what? No, no, no. You don't understand. I had my sins forgiven. And you go through the whole list again. I'm changed. I'm different. You, you knew me when I grew up and, and now I'm totally different. Mom, dad, whatever difficult relationship that knew you before and knows you now. And you try to explain it to them. And the evidence is right there in front of them that you are fundamentally different than you used to be. And they don't believe John 10, 25 and 26 witnesses to divine power. They will deny it. Because they are not his sheep or not yet. What is our task? Like John the Baptist, preach when you can't see the horizon of fruit. Faithfully proclaim Christ and leave the results in his hands. That's our task on this earth. And don't be surprised if God should open the eyes and the hearts When a humble, faithful witness speaks the gracious truth of the good news about the good shepherd. Don't be surprised when someone comes to new birth and eternal life through your words. Your humble, feeble, failing, stumbling attempts at witness. Don't be surprised. It's how you got here. And we ought not be surprised. If those testimonies bear fruit after the witness has gone home. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, our good shepherd, thank you. Thank you for walking into a sheepfold. Whatever that sheepfold was for us. Bad religion. No religion. And getting us, leading us out, bringing us to yourself, bringing us to still waters and green pastures. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our shepherd. You are good. Thank you for laying down your life in our place. 
Thank you for giving us eternal life. Thank you for securing our eternal life and promising that none could snatch us out of your hand. Thank you for giving us your word and a message to speak to a world that desperately needs it. Thank you for the testimony of supernatural power. You have given every born again believer. We have seen the impossible and the miraculous in our own lives firsthand. God, we thank you for those who have gone before before us who have proclaimed the truth faithfully so that we could hear and believe. And many of those proclaimed the truth without ever seeing the results, without ever seeing the fruits that they were faithful and heaven knows May we likewise be faithful as trophies of your grace, proclaiming your grace to a needy world. In your son's name we pray. Amen.